Chapter 9, Security Strategies. Okay, so this is the chapter that we're focusing mainly on security topics. We already interwoven a lot of our security concepts in a lot of the other chapters, but now with this, we have this just this dedicated chapter just on security. So we're going to talk about how to secure workstations, authorization, authentication, how to set up a wireless router, in general, learn how to recognize, remove, and protect against malicious software, things of that nature. So, securing a workstation. There are two primary goals for securing your workstation, and that is to protect a resource or an asset, and to not to interfere with the function of the overall system. For example, we can secure a computer system by locking it in a closet and never having hooked up, but realistically, how could we use that if it's locked in a closet? So sometimes these two are, goals are in conflict, but our goal is to make the system or make the resource available. The resource is always available while still providing adequate levels of protection. That's what we're trying to combat here. All right, so. Authentication. How do we authenticate users? Authentication is proving that an individual is who they say they are. Authorization is determining if they are, after they've already proven who they are, they have to be able to show what access they should have. Normally there's a third A, which is accountability, and that's things that we can hold accountable. So authentication. Let's, uh, if we're looking at like an ATM, for example, a ATM will authenticate us by two factor, our PIN number, something that we know, and something that we have, our ATM card. That's two factor authentication. There's a third factor, which is biometrics, because our bank could require two out of the three, or all three, depending on how the account is set up. So once you've proven who you say you are, then you have to look at, are you really able to do what you're trying to do? For example, can you go to your ATM and withdraw $5,000? Are you authorized to do that? You may be authorized to withdraw money from the account, but are you authorized to withdraw that much money from the account? So keep that in mind. Uh, best practice, always assign users passwords. So with authentication, we can control how users log in. Normally, we would uh, enter credentials, like a username and password. That way, they would have to know their username and password. So there's two types. You can have a welcome screen, which would have all users, photos, and names already across. So you just click on your appropriate photo and log in as you with your password. However, a more secure method is actually not allowing the welcome screen. That way the users have to know the password and the username. Okay, so how do we gain access to our user settings? We can actually go to a switch dialog box and type N-E-T-P-L-W-I-Z. Or you could just go to control panel and user accounts. Here is one form of our user accounts. We can see what users are there, what groups they belong to, what passwords they have, if we want to manage their passwords, and all of that good stuff. Some shortcut keys. Windows L for locking a workstation. When we get up and leave a computer, most people stay logged in. However, you can actually lock the station so that no one can be accessing anything that you add up. And then this will stay locked until either an administrator unlocks it, kicks you out, or you unlock it. Some other good practices is to disable the guest account because if we're not using it, it shouldn't be enabled. Resetting passwords. If you're an administrator, you can reset someone's password. 
If not, we've already discussed how to reset passwords using other methods. Don't forget to set passwords. You need to type a password in, confirm it, and maybe type a password hint. Create strong passwords, normally eight characters. Also, three of the four. First, uppercase, lowercase. Third is numbers, fourth is special characters. You want to have three of those four. The more you have, the better. But at the same time, you don't want to make it too complex, because if it's too complex, you'll write it down, and that defeats the purpose of having a password. Next, folder and files encryption, also called EFS. We've already done this as a lab before, but you can actually do encryption based off a certificate so that files or folders or data in any sense can be uh, encrypted on a machine. And if that is copied off the machine, then uh, those items can no longer be read. So we can look at any of the uh, folders, go to its properties, go to security, or advanced under the general tab. If we're looking at encryption, we can encrypt it just by general tab, advance, and then clicking encrypt. If we want additional security functionality, we'd be going to the security tab. Next, Windows firewalls. Again, a firewall, probably a software one here, is going to be used to filter software so that you can block things that come in or go out based on whatever criteria that you want. There are three types normally. There is a network hardware firewall, a network software firewall, and a personal firewall, which is normally software based. So we can have software firewalls running on different types of devices on the network so it even gets filtered out before it even comes to us. Moving on, security policies. So this is normally done at a server level, but you can actually create local security policies, things that you want all accounts to adhere to, you can do that. Normally only available for business and or professional editions of Windows, but again, normally we use servers to handle this. Next, BitLocker encryption. We've already talked about encryption. We've already talked about whole drive encryption. And so BitLocker is just another form of encryption that we can actually set to uh, save a key or a pin key or a passcode in some type of file, like a USB file. That way you can't read the data from the hard drive without the USB key. BitLocker encryption normally uh, does provide greater security, but at a price, so keep that in mind. Other security features could be a BIOS password, and that means you could set a BIOS password so first no one can get into the BIOS, and or it won't boot to uh, pass post without a password, and or it will not boot to any bootable devices without a password. It just kind of depends on the settings that you need. You can set whole disk encryption, again, a password. Additional methods could just be physical security, destroying data before you toss it in a garbage can, all general stuff. So let's go back to that authentication. We already talked about something that you have. So that could be a card, it could be a fob, a wireless token, could be a cell phone token, it could be lots of different things. But this is going to be something that you have on you, like some type of smart card, RFID card, which then means we would need a reader to read that card. But that's one way of authenticating you. Next could be biometrics, a retina scan, a fingerprint scan, palm print, Anything that contains something that you are. And again, the next one is something that you know, like a password. So physical security. 
if it's important data, keep it locked up. Make sure that your computer case is locked. Normally chained to your desk depending on your environment. At home, probably not. At work, you're probably going to have locked PCs. Don't forget about filters. IT normally will filter what sites you can go to. That way you can make sure that they're not getting anything from the internet infecting your computer. Also, maybe just labeling your computer, writing your name on it, if you're allowed to. Next, data destruction. Keep in mind that every time that we generate data, we should make sure that we're going to be destroying or disposing of that data correctly. So if it's in like a hard drive, we may want to destroy the hard drive. If it's paper, we may want to shred the paper. You can get hard drive shredders. Next, educate users. Things like educate them so that they're aware of what shoulder surfing is, or how to input their passwords correctly, or how not to write their passwords down. Things like uh, paying attention to tailgate, uh, tailgaters. It could also be basic uh, social engineering for user education, like you don't want to be able uh, able to open up any email. What to look forward in an email? Things like uh, attachments, things that may look too uh, too real or not uh, what you'd be expecting. Big thing here is if you're never sure, always contact the person or delete it. Uh, a lot of files come as zip. And not that that's a bad thing, it's just a lot of viruses come with this way too. Big part of this is common sense. So rules to protect yourself, it's always know where your stuff is at. Never leave your stuff alone. And uh, before you get up and walk away, lock the screen. Make sure you have a password. So how do we deal with malicious software? Big part of this is up-to-date antivirus, up-to-date malware scanners, up-to-date operating system. Also, scanning. Don't just have them, but use them. Make sure you have a virus program. Make sure you have adware. Make sure you have spyware removal software. Know what you're up against so that you can better protect yourself, like an antivirus. Protects against viruses. Anti-adware protects against adware. Anti-spyware or uh, anti-malware uh, protects against spyware, so pay attention. Keyloggers, they're just there to capture your keystrokes. You can get anti-keyloggers, they're built in the most malicious software. Know what a worm is, know what a Trojan is. A Trojan is a program or something that you think is legit, that's posing as something legit that really is bad. A lot of photos that you get may have Trojans built into the photo itself. It's not hard to do. Rootkits. This could be a, a virus that actually loads itself into the operating system for it to hide. All right, so step-by-step -step attack plan. So if you think you have infection, identify the malware symptoms. You could do this by going to uh, Explorer, looking at the boot processes, like an email, maybe you can't access your AV software. Maybe you get random messages popping up. Maybe your PC is just acting kind of weird. So you want to kind of see what's going on and then kind of look through the documentation online for viruses that meet those sympt uh, symptoms. Quarantine your computer. That way you don't infect other computers. Download an antivirus. A good antivirus and anti malware and run it. So, what are some examples like Trend Micro or Avast, AVG, Kaspersky, Malware Bytes? Malware Bytes is an anti malware program, but I mean, that's also a good one. Semantic, Norton, Panda, there's a lot of names out there. And again, the anti malware is going to be Malware Bytes. Update it and then run the software. 
run it in Windows, run it in safe mode, run it a third time. You want to make sure that you get as much of the uh, malicious code off as possible. Don't forget, after you run the antivirus uh, software, run the anti-malware uh, software. This is subjective, but you may want to purge restore points because sometimes viruses can hide there. Clean it up any of the leftovers. So if you get any random errors, work on cleanup. Get rid of uh, any files that you may have logged into or loaded because of the uh, antivirus slash anti-malware that you downloaded. Also anything that it quarantined, get rid of. You may also want to clean up the registry and clean up Internet Explorer. Basically, you want to make sure that you're cleaning up everything behind you. Next, go deep. Make sure that you actually removed all of the virus, not just part of it. You may have to go deeper to find the malware processes. But you can also use online search engines to find what virus you have. Well, that's going to be more your antivirus, anti-malware. They'll let you know what you have. You'd use the internet to do the research on all the components of that virus, where they hide. That way you can make sure that uh, we're getting rid of everything that we need. Next, get rid of the rootkits. You want to make sure that you're getting all the different little areas. That way the virus itself won't come back. So rootkits are kind of tricky because they actually will hide themselves in key components. So they're not always easy to find. Normally once you find the rootkit that you have, you can go to most uh, major antivirus websites and you can get an anti-rootkit program that will allow you to remove the rootkit and will give you all the steps. So make sure to remove the rootkit. You may have uh, data corruption for Windows. You may have other types of corruption. So at this point, after all the cleanup is done, if you have any issues booting, spend this time fixing the issues booting. Re-enable system protection and also educate the user how they got infected, general way that they can protect themselves, things like that. Users aren't going to know how they get viruses, so you want to make sure that you're educating them. Next step, protect against mal uh, malicious software. Make sure that you have the scanners, antivirus, anti-malware, up to date and running. And actually that's really it. Big part of this is when you have your scanner, make sure to actually use it. Have it set to run the scans. And that's actually it for our security chapter. So I wanted to thank you guys. You guys have a great day.